evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much, Sunshine. What a name! <laughs> and also uh, Austin for for this very kind introduction and for having me. It's a real pleasure, and uh, you know, you have a university here where interdisciplinary exchange is by definition being fostered just by the variety of institutes and directions you have. So I think it's a very fertile ground for bringing certain topics forward and I hope you'll find what I have to say this evening of interest. Is the acoustics good? Can you hear me? Uh, I have tried to, the topic was uh, suggested by the Mental Health Institute in this form, so I've tried to pack in as much as I can in the time available for you and I hope you'll find it interesting. I hope uh, it's not too much, but we'll see. So the topic is global shipping and the climate challenge. Now there's quite a lot to say, but we'll start at the beginning. Shipping, maritime transport, it is the lifeblood of world trade. Trade as we know, as we know it, and the uh, trade-led globalization and development is predicated on transportation. And most of this transportation is carried out by sea. You see the shipping lanes in this particular slide. Maritime transport is an engine uh, for trade and development. Over 80% of the volume of merchandise trade, global trade, is carried by sea. By value, it's about 70% uh, from port to port, of course. Now, uh, in part, this is due to the large quantities in bulk can only be carried by sea over long distances. And its economies of scale, as far as containerized transport is concerned, the largest container ships take now, we will see this in a minute, but uh, many thousands uh, TEUs, and so you can uh, transport large quantities. Maritime transport provides access to global markets, that's very important. In fact, it's critical for all countries, even those that are landlocked. Indeed, their particular disadvantage is defined by their lack of access to uh, maritime uh, networks and access to global markets. For developing countries, key factors are connectivity or lack thereof and the cost of transportation, which in developing countries is much higher per average than in, in other parts of the world. Globalization means there is a particularly strong interconnectedness and interdependence of shipping and ports. And to illustrate the point, over 60% of goods are loaded and unloaded in developing countries. That illustrates the fact that you cannot think of matters as a them and us. Uh, we're okay here, never mind over there, because ships need ports all over the world and outsourcing of production locations, etc. has meant that we're very, very closely interconnected. So shipping and ports are actually key nodes in global supply chains. And as a result, one can say that's vital for, for global trade. At the same time, seaborne trade is a derived demand and therefore the uh, developments reflect developments in world trade and, and the global economy. One slide here just very quickly to illustrate the growth of seaborne trade with reference to world merchandise trade on the top and world GDP. The index starts with 190 and you see it's, uh, it's gone in the same direction, albeit not in the same uh, curves. And you see everywhere the dip of 2009. There's been a very uh, marked trend in the increasing size of container ships. And this is a slide which I've borrowed from a, a colleague, another uh, colleague working in this informal network of experts with us, Satoshi Inoue, who was former uh, Secretary General of the International Association of Ports and Harbors, and presented this in 2013. So by 2013, as you can see, and you can see the development there, the largest container ships were about 18,000 TEUs. TEU means 20-foot equivalent unit, which is the standard box which fits on a, a truck or a lorry. In the US, you also have 40-foot equivalent units. But internationally, TEUs means 20-foot equivalent units. So in 2020, uh, 20, um, 13, the largest ship delivered was 18,000 TEUs. I've just looked what it is now, and if the largest ship delivered is 21,500 TEUs. And again, I had already referred to economies of scale. You can imagine, you can just load more, uh, more containers on a ship, and you have relatively low unit costs. <coughs> now, along with this growth in ship size, of course, goes a need for preparedness of ports. This is just by the by, uh, in, in terms of dredging and accounting for the uh, for the um, increased draft needs.
real-time transport and the uh, environment. On the right, you have again sort of summarized what I've already said, but uh, we want to concentrate today, the topic is global shipping and climate change, but essentially I think it's, uh, it's, it's important to couch this in, in the proper context. And I would start with environmental challenges uh, come in two forms and formats, and that's not often enough properly uh, recognized. The one thing is what we all associate with that and environmental challenge, the effects of a particular industry, in this case maritime transport, on the environment, on the marine environment particularly, but also air pollution for example. That's pollution including CO2 emissions. There's a flip side of the coin though, and that is environmental impact on maritime transport, and that notably of course concerns climatic variability and change, addressing the impact. And it is important to address the two sides of this, uh, these environmental problems or environmental challenges, also in the light of the Paris Agreement on climate change and the so-called 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. I don't know if any one of you is familiar with that, but essentially the SDG, the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, is the international community's international plan of action involving 17 uh, goals with 169 associated targets, or so more specified, which are integrated and indivisible, global in nature, and universally applicable. This is like, like the development plan uh, of the world community for the next 15 years, period of time being 2015 to 2030. And it's much more integrated one, than whatever came before. Sustainable and resilient transport is amongst the cross-cutting issues of relevance for achievement or progress on several of these goals and targets, including those which are set out, SDG, Sustainable Development Goal 13, Take Urgent Action to Combat Climate Change and its Impact, SDG 9, Build Resilient Infrastructure, SDG 14, Conservation and Sustainable Use of the Oceans, and SDG 1.5 I've singled out because poverty elimination, poverty reduction is very important and as you can see resilience uh, and uh, reduce, uh, reducing exposure and vulnerability to climate re related extreme events is something which contributes to poverty elimination which is uh, the first SDG 1. So this is, uh, this is a plan of action and one has to see what remains but the prospect of action being taken on this basis is are quite good, particularly given that all these targets are underpinned by indicators which are measurable and there's a whole process in really following progress. So this has given sort of renewed impetus to certain, certain considerations. Let me just get the arrow back. No, that didn't work. Let me just go. No, we're not here. Okay, so we're back. This slide shows you uh, the results of a paper on the cumulative human impacts on the ocean. It's a paper by Halpern et al. 2015 in Nature identifying uh, anthropogenic stresses. And I've given you some of the details. I don't really want to go through this uh, in, in, in detail. But shipping is one of the factors which contributes to the um, impact on the, um, on the environment. So it's quite, the, 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 the numbers here are quite stark as you can see. Uh, and certainly this is, this is an area for shipping where attention needs to be uh, paid. The one side of the coin, the pollution side of the coin, the, the, the traditional environmental impacts of an activity. In the uh, marine environment, obviously, you have no natural borders. Everything is, is one. There's one uh, plane, if you will. And pollution doesn't recognize man-made borders, of course. The seas are being used as global highways, and there is, therefore, an obvious potential for pollution from shipping, both operational and accidents. And any such pollution can be a threat to economic activities and, of course, to marine ecosystems and biodiversity. The international legal framework to prevent and control ship source pollution is relatively well developed and as some examples show can be highly effective in implementing international policy objectives. I'm emphasizing this on purpose because it might serve as a model for uh, future action. This particular one example is oil pollution from tankers. Now the US doesn't adhere to the international convention international conventions, but this is one of the instances where the US has been leading and doesn't need the international conventions because it has much better or, or has initiated national legislation with the Oil Pollution Act 1990 
uh, to, to uh, bring this forward. But essentially, internationally, oil pollution from tankers has been very significantly reduced since the 1970s as a result of very effective regulation on oil pollution prevention, preparedness and response, but also on liability and compensation. We've done a report on this and the reference is there for you. You can, can get this electronically if you're interested. Um, these are, this is an overview of the type of international conventions that exist in the field of oil pollution. Um, in the field of oil pollution, you can see oil pollution prevention is MARPOL and Annex 1 and 2 is compulsory for all member states. Uh, the Uni United States, for example, has ratified MARPOL uh, Annex 1 and 2. Um, oil pollution response, you can see preparedness, response and cooperation, what to do in the case of an, an oil spill, for example, and then liability and compensation in the case of an oil spill arising. These are the, the, main, uh, the main conventions. No, it doesn't work. This is the technology of it for you, isn't it? Uh, so to illustrate a point, because I'm just making statements here, so it has reduced significantly, but this is illustrated there. So the blue line on the graph is the uh, development of uh, seaborne oil trade, and uh, the green line is the number of spills of seven tons or over which you can see, and that's called medium or large spills. So as you can see, this has been diverging very significantly over the recent decades, and this is borne out also by the, um, by the number of spills, and there are more statistics which I'm not putting up here, by the amount of oil spill. As you can see, there's a very clear trend, and this is in direct response to international legislation, uh, starting with the Tory Canyon in the 19... In, usually in response to a massive oil pollution incident. And oil pollution is so very well regulated because it plays to the public. And it, you see the seabirds with the, with, the, with the sticky oil on them and so on, and everybody is calling for action. You have uh, pollution, for example, from chemicals, which uh, are also uh, very, um, very much of a concern to human health. You, health. you could have explosions. There is a convention uh, that has been agreed but it's not entered into force because there is less of a political will. And this is in part, as I say, because oil pollution is much more tangible than other forms of pollution. But this example shows what can be done with effective regulation. So the IMO Pollution Convention, just to round off this picture, I have already mentioned it tends to be pollution, prevention, response, and then in some cases liability and compensation. In terms of the fields that are being regulated at IMO, oil pollution I already mentioned, there's chemical pollution, garbage and sewage, uh, air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, dumping of waste and other matter, ballast water management, very important for biodiversity and uh, to curb the spread of invasive species through ballast water management exchange, anti-fouling systems, that is a convention that deals with ship paints, uh, and ship recycling. There's a link here which gives you the uh, status of these conventions and you can see how much, in terms of global tonnage, how, many, um, how much of the uh, world shipping is covered really by these uh, conventions. Now let's turn over to climate variability and change. We're still on the pollution side of things. So climate variability and change is a global challenge and a defining issue of our era. These are the words of the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Um, interestingly, because the international agenda and the role of climate change on the international agenda reflects nothing more than an acknowledgement of the uh, urgent need for action. It's not really convenient, it's not politically correct, but the evidence is mounting that action is needed. In particular, since 2013, the latest uh, IPCC report is increasingly compelling scientific uh, evidence and particular impetus to uh, addressing uh, climate change has been provided by the Stern Review, which had been commissioned in 2006 by the British government to look at the economics of climate change. And uh, the outcome of this was that in the case of inaction, around 5 to 20 percent of global GDP annually would have to be spent on addressing the effects of climate change, whereas in the case of uh, proactive uh, addressing these issues, this would be in the order of 1 to 2 percent of global GDP. And while you can debate the order of magnitude or the specifics of these forecasts, it's quite clear that there is a good case for acting uh, early rather than waiting for problems to arise. 
climate variability and change and the forecasts associated with that are particularly serious development threat for the poorest and most vulnerable countries, the least developed countries, and for instance, the small island developing states, which are sea locked and therefore face particularly a particular problem. So we've been working on these types of issues since 2008, which is very early internationally, and have integrated considerations of climate change into our work on transportation. Uh, more information you can find on the, under this web link. I'll try my little arrow again here. This is a slide which just gives you an overview of our work. Obviously, I'm not going to go through that, but we started with an expert meeting. We later uh, edited a book on this uh, topic, initiated work together with UNECE, uh, UN Economic Commission for Europe, to, uh, on, on an expert group on climate change impacts and adaptation for international transport networks and nodes. So the focus here is already on the impact and adaptation side. That uh, uh, group came out with a report, and actually Adonis Velegrakis, who's also here, has been working on this report. We uh, continued our work with a number of expert meetings with increasing focus on the issue of impacts and adaptation, which is under-considered. And more recently, uh, looking particularly at the issue from the perspective of small island developing states, including as part of a technical assistance project, Austin has already mentioned that, and I'll say a bit more about this. So this is very much grown work, and I'll, I'll try to convey uh, a few of the insights that we've gained as part of this work, as part of my presentation. Most recently, we've published a, the results of a port industry survey on climate variability and change. That's just out, and we have finished the, uh, the project, which I have uh, uh, listed at the, at the end. What are the climate change implications for maritime transport? Again, there are two sides of the coins, and I cannot overemphasize how important it is in communicating this and in terms of awareness raising uh, to distinguish these two sides. And no more so than in areas and in environments where there is still a very a strong and active debate about whether climate change is anthropogenic. Uh, mitigation is action directed at addressing the causes of climate change. So they are by definition addressed uh, uh, or uh, um, uh, targeted at the longer term because there is no quick fix. At the same time and quite irrespective of the causes of increased climate variability and change, there's a need for adaptation, for adjustment to changing circumstances. And again, irrespective of the causes of, uh, of, of increasing climate variability and change, observations very clearly indicate that that is the case. Uh, so even if it were a natural, even if it is a natural cycle, it doesn't really matter. We as uh, humans need to adjust to the changing circumstances that we find. And this is very often being mixed up. So people hear climate change and as a knee-jerk reaction, they're thinking of emissions control and all sorts of discussions start. Whereas this other side, the implications in terms of impacts and the need to address these, remains uh, irrespective of that debate. In maritime transport, as everywhere else, uh, much of the international debate and the policy deliberations focuses on, focus on mitigation. And there has been comparatively little focus to this date on the study of impact and the development of adaptation uh, policies and actions which are urgently required. Now, on the side of mitigation, the case for CO2 mitigation in shipping is strong. On the one hand, more than 80%, some say 90, but um, it's, it's in that order, of, in, in that uh, area, more than 80% of the global trade in goods is carried by sea. And CO2 the, and shipping is by far the most CO2 efficient mode of transportation by unit. Again, this is explained by the economies of scale. International shipping only emits around 2.2% of global emissions from fuel combustions, which doesn't sound a lot at all. Uh, it's equivalent roughly to the emissions of Germany, so it's not that little. But more importantly, the emissions are rising. I mentioned shipping is a derived demand, so accordingly, with growth in trade and shipping, uh, the emissions would be increasing, and this is forecast, uh, the emissions are forecast to increase up to fivefold by 2050. So it's not really a solution not to do anything. Shipping is heavily reliant on fuel oil for propulsion, and that has, of course, also implications for mitigation efforts, and uh, there is a nexus between the energy costs and the um, and, and mitigation efforts. We've done a study on this some years back when the oil price was very high, if you're interested. It's one of the few empirical studies in the field and has been taken as a basis for some of the deliberations of the uh, IMO uh, 
um, uh, group, uh, expert group on, uh, on uh, the development of mitigation measures. Emissions from international shipping, not domestic shipping, international shipping are not covered by the Kyoto Protocol. And negotiations on emissions control have been proceeding for some years under the auspices of the IMO, but still under the overall umbrella of the UNFCCC uh, convention and process. There has been a renewed impetus now following the Paris Agreement adoption and entry into force. And as you know, this is a great number of states have ratified the um, Paris Agreement. And there is now an impetus somehow to take care of shipping as well. So what is the status? of these negotiations at the IMO for emissions control. In 2011, by majority, the above package of technical and operational measures was adopted. These are all measures geared at ensuring uh, CO2 emissions reductions, and I think they are quite successful so far. Um, I underline that by majority because this is quite important in the international uh, policy arena. Normally you strive for consensus, so if something is uh, agreed by majority that implies some kind of lack of consensus. In this particular case, uh, China, India and Saudi Arabia were um, very vocally against adoption of this, uh, of this package, in part probably because of the still outstanding question of market-based instruments, which is very controversial. But this package of measures was adopted and is very interesting from a legal perspective. This was integrated into the MARPOL Convention, Annex 6, which deals with air pollution. And the MARPOL Convention, all IMO Convention, have a tacit amendment procedure. So instead of having to positively express uh, your, your um, willingness to be bound by this, once something is agreed in principle, it enters into force unless parties object, which makes it much more uh, easy to move ahead. Of course, this is just amendments to existing conventions and not, uh, not uh, the, the, the creation of new conventions. So market-based instruments, uh, incentives basically for emissions control. There have been various uh, proposals uh, discussed uh, at the IMO until 2014 and then these discussions were suspended. It was too controversial. It's going to be a levy on fuel or an emissions trading scheme or a combination of this. Uh, but basically it's been too controversial to be pursued. There seemed to be renewed uh, consideration of this this year, or actually last year, by an intercessional working group um, on reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and integration of this topic in what is called the roadmap, which has been um, agreed already, but it, which is going to be formally adopted uh, in a few weeks probably at the next meeting of the Marine Environment Protection Committee of the IMO, uh, 72nd session. So that is something to be carefully watched, but at the moment we don't know yet what's going to happen. If market-based measures are introduced, that is going to raise or give the potential for raising quite a lot of revenue as well, and it's going to be interesting to see where this is going to be used. Now coming to the other side of the coin, the impacts uh, that climate variability and change have in the field of maritime transport. There will be direct and indirect impacts sea level rise, temperature precipitation changes, extreme events and other factors are likely to affect the ports and other coastal transport infrastructure and the corresponding hinterland connections directly in the form of damages, but also indirectly in terms of disruption and delay and economic knock-on effects. In terms of shipping being a derived demand, obviously changes in agricultural production, for example, or production locations will affect the demand for shipping, uh, the uh, potential, potentially the costs, uh, and so on. On the positive side, if you will, there is potential in shipping through the opening of new Arctic sea lanes that in itself bear certain uh, problems, economic, but environmental particularly. But this is, uh, could, could also be uh, economically interesting because it could cut out uh, the cost of uh, 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 the cost of shipping because you can just go quicker, as it were. Altogether, we do know that climate variability and change is likely to exacerbate really, uh, re existing uh, transport-related challenges. So this is just in overview the status quo. Now, shipping and seaports are vulnerable to storms. That is not really a secret. On the left, you will see a very 
um, a pertinent graph there, or, or, or figure there. This is actually taken from a from a joint paper we did with um, Professor Becker. Um, this shows, based on NOAA data, seaports within 50 kilometers of tropical sea storm tracks over 50-year period started, starting in 1960. And you can see the green dots are the seaports, the red is the storm tracks. And I'm telling you already, because I don't have the slide later, if you look, the SIDS groups, they're all in these uh, storm tracks. So this is, here is the Caribbean, small island developing states. Here is the, um, uh, is the Indian Ocean, uh, is the, is, uh, is the Pacific. So uh, this, is, this is one example. On the right you have actually model, and it's very nicely uh, visualized, of the Port of Providence here, a flood simulation, due to Category 3 storm surge um, and half a meter mean sea level rise. And you can see how much of the port area would be inundated. I think this is very nicely visualized, but potentially, of course, this will arise. There has been a seminal study in the United States uh, called the U.S. Gulf Coast Study, which was initi initiated post-Katrina um, in the Gulf Coast area, where 60% of U.S. energy exports uh, transit. And this here, I think, if you look at the, 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 the uh, figures there, uh, they show you uh, the situation. But here, if you just look at the numbers, is quite uh, disconcerting what a relatively, relatively minor uh, relative sea level rise. I think this is not beyond the realm of expectations by the end of the century could uh, lead to permanent inundation of these uh, transport facilities. So that's a great, uh, great concern. And in fact, it was presentation of this study at our 2009 expert meeting in Geneva, which really changed the mood in the room, where up to that point, I had said this before, the knee-jerk reaction tends to be climate change mitigation, and everybody wants to be seen to be doing something good, but there isn't the self-interest necessary. And when this was shown, suddenly the mindset changed in the room. And everybody said, hang on, we're all sitting in the same boat here. We need to do something about this. It's in our self-interest to address this. And in fact, there was a the Greek delegate uh, phrased, it, uh, phrased it quite well. He said, in, as far as climate change is concerned, maritime transport is much less the culprit than the victim because the exposure to the impacts of climate change are much more worrying than the uh, than the, uh, let's say, the, the CO2 emissions coming from shipping. Ports are gateways to global markets. I've already mentioned that. And just to see what is at stake here, there are two studies. The one was done in 2008 uh, by the OECD and looked at 136 port megacities. These are port cities with more than a million citizens. And just looked at the uh, exposure to coastal flooding of the population and the assets in 2005. And the uh, asset exposure was estimated at $3 trillion. A few years later, Lenten, for a study by Allianz, uh, did the same calculations but added a sea level rise of a half a meter, called a tipping scenario, by 2050. And the asset exposure in the same 136 mega cities, port megacities went up to $28 trillion US dollars. And just to show you what are the ports uh, with the highest relative uh, increase in exposed asset according to this. You can see Miami is the second one. Actually, New York, New York, uh, Newark, you've got a little bit further down, then you've got New Orleans again, Virginia Beach. But uh, a lot of these ports are in, in Asia, some of the largest ports we have. But these are the, the kind of, uh, this is in, in billions, so you can see what is at stake potentially. Here's a study from uh, the University of Tokyo and illustrating the uh, projected port city damage due to a combined mean sea level rise and storm surge in Tokyo Bay. This is two ports, Port of Tokyo and Kanagawa in Tokyo Bay and this particular uh, figure here shows you the total damages, the inundation and the amount of uh, damage. So on the left you can see the air is at flood risk for different scenario for a mean expected storm surge due to future typhoon in 2100 for a 60 centimeter, that's a thick blue line, and a two meter effectively mean sea level rise. So a very significant inundation. And the simulated damages and the cost. So for instance, um, 
here, 2.7 meters, you can see. If you look here, that's above 30 trillion yen, which is about 285 billion, I've just looked yesterday, uh, US dollars. So we're talking massive potential exposure, uh, which certainly concentrates the mind that some action needs to, some thinking has to be uh, started. Major climate change impacts on ports come in various forms. These are some pertinent ones. On the left you have the, the, the climate factors and on the right you have some of the uh, relevant impacts. And it goes obviously from, from damage to uh, disruption and uh, the, the facilities themselves, but also the hinterland and so on, and many implications. So how do you even start addressing this? Here is a slide, uh, I had already mentioned Satoshi Inoue, the former uh, Secretary General of the International Association of Ports and Harbors, a very thoughtful man, a very good uh, collaborator as well. And I think this is a very nice slide because he made the point um, he's very strongly advocating, and I think this is, a, this is something which everybody who works in this field comes to, to resolve, that it's critical to mainstream climate change consideration into ordinary operations and planning processes. And this illustrates the point. Like uh, economic factors, operational factors, financial, environmental, natural factors that have to be taken into account as part of normal decision making, Climate change is just one additional factor which somehow has to be uh, considered. But it's complex, of course. And to incorporate climate change uh, adaptation in port planning and development is, is, an, int is an intricate uh, process. It's also expensive. And uh, just to give you an example here, this is um, uh, to, to continue the sort of the, the, the story. This is. Um, a slide showing you a uh, port asset sensitivity assessment. This is actually from a study done by the US Army Corps of Engineers at Navy Station Norfolk, where all the US naval assets are located. And what they did, they had a very well-funded uh, project. They looked at different sea level rise scenario. They weren't looking at the probability of these scenario arising. They just said half a meter, one meter, 1.5 meters. And they looked at the, uh, looked at the exposure of assets in Naval Station Norfolk. So that involved a lot of modeling, and in addition, it involved a lot of uh, component uh, network analysis. So you can see just the network diagramming and the connectivity, how complex this is. What they found eventually was that their most precious, their most expensive asset, which was uh, the birth for a um, for a, an aircraft carrier was the most vulnerable because the control center, the electronic control center, was very much exposed to flooding. So this was, uh, of course, news that nobody really was, was too happy with hearing, and the risk has materialized. But that also illustrates how important it is to go through these processes. Now, how do you do this if you don't have money? And that's a, that's, that's a very important uh, point because, as I said, we are interconnected. It's not a case of everybody who can take care of themselves does, and never mind uh, all the rest. Everybody is, is dependent on one another. Actually, the um, Japanese Japanese uh, tsunami illustrated that a few years ago. Of course, different reasons, but the disruptions to global supply chains were spectacular as a result of the of the tsunami. And this is exactly what illustrates the interconnectedness. Regulatory developments, I think, I already mentioned at the beginning of my talk that regulation can be very effective to implement public policy objectives. Uh, regulatory developments, I think, are going to play a much bigger role than they have done so far in the future. Also in view of, uh, as I mentioned, achieving progress on the sustainable development goals. Examples would include in the US the executive order, which as you probably know has been rescinded by President Trump in, in April. Uh, but it was an interesting approach because following the impacts of or following the experience with Hurricane Sandy, the Obama administration issued this executive order to prepare the United States for the impacts of climate change, which meant that all federally funded uh, project had to take climate change into consideration. It would be interesting to see whether that has actually engendered a, a different culture. Maybe that something has stayed uh, sort of in terms of processes, because executive order or not, it, it's certainly not a bad idea to integrate these considerations. 
in the European Union, and this is a very important development, there is legislation in force. It's secondary uh, EU legislation, namely a directive. It's amendments to the Environmental Impacts Assessment Directive, which means that for any, it's not just publicly funded projects, for any large-scale um, infrastructure projects, you need to, to carry out environmental impact assessments. And while these have been traditionally looking at the impacts on the environment, the amendments now also require that uh, these EIAs take into account the carbon footprint of, of, an, of a project, but also the impacts of, uh, the, of climate change on this proposed uh, project. And this is very interesting because even though it's not very specific in the legislation, so we don't know what exactly it means, but what we do know is that uh, old or established return periods, for example, for extreme events, will not be able to be taken into account. One has to go with the, with, the, with the projections, that's for sure. So that's going to be very interesting, but that's going to, because it is a law now in the EU, it's certainly going to lead to, uh, to um, litigate, uh, sorry, li uh, to, to uh, similar leg legislation, I think, in other places, going to make schools somehow. So this, uh, this directive had to be implemented in member states by May 2017. Maybe that has happened, maybe that hasn't happened. But in the EU, because it's supranational law, there is a, a direct recourse for failure to implement a directive. So this is not without teeth, even if you haven't got the legislation on time in place in all the member states. Now to come to the small islands uh, developing states, Austin had already mentioned and, and so have I earlier on, uh, that they face particular uh, problems and also that we've been doing some work on this. So in a nutshell, what are some of the issues these countries face? They are particularly dependent on imports, which means international transportation. They face much higher uh, transport costs than world average. In the Caribbean trade, for instance, they are 30% higher than world average because they are outside the, 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 the main shipping lanes and need feeder transport. Coastal transport infrastructure is coastal because of the relative lack of low-lying land in most of these uh, islands. So much of the low-lying land is at the coast where you could build. Obviously, ports have to be at the coast, but airports too. So um, much of this transport infrastructure is at coast, and these are critical lifelines for uh, these countries because all their needs, energy, uh, food, all their trade comes by ship, ports, and all the tourism is air transport dependent. And then there's, of course, cruise ship tourism, which is another has different requirements, but that often competes with berthing space for commercial vessels as well. So it's very... Uh, very, this is a very uh, pertinent example of the dependency on international transport. Um, and these assets are threatened by sea level rise and extreme events. In general, because it, these uh, nations very often are anyway exposed to natural disasters, but also in terms of projections for climate change, they are often at the forefront. There is a very strong nexus in these countries, typically, between transport and tourism, the three S tourism models, sea, sun, and sand, because that's why you go to a since you don't want to go to the mountains there by and large, it's the beach tourism, is often a very significant industry, and that is threatened by climate-driven coastal uh, and beach erosion. At the same time, uh, these factors are threatening the integrity uh, and the operational integrity of the facilitating transport infrastructure. So it's a vicious circle, if you will. Our project has tried to address some of this, but before getting to this, let me just show you a couple of slides here to illustrate the point about the SIDS. This is a slide uh, with reference uh, to, to 2011 data, but you can see, for instance, um, on, the, on the right, you see the percentage of visitors arriving by air, and in the middle, the travel and tourism percentage of GDP. And, uh, of course, the top of the top of the list for GDP is Antigua and Barbuda, 78.5% of their GDP is associated with travel and tourism. In terms of the, uh, the air travel arrival, for me to say anything is evident. And tourism accounts for more than, uh, than uh, 30, but certainly 50% of GDP in many of these countries. Now take the example of Dominica. Dominica faced one 
heavy precipitation event on the 27th of August uh, 2015, when 434 millimeters of rain, that's really a lot, fell in one day. That one event caused a lot of damage, and this was estimated in, a, in, a, in the rapid da damage assessment at over 90% of the country's GDP. So this is one day, one event. And uh, just making this, this point, I think, quite strong, most of the damage was in transportation. Now, Dominica is also a country which has been particularly hard hit in, the last, in last year's hurricane season. And uh, we had an opportunity to discuss with people from the seaports and airports administration. These issues are not of academic concern in these countries. This is a very, there's a very real need to, to uh, address this. So the storm impacts on the SIDS were particularly uh, prominently displayed, if you will, in the recent hurricane season, hurricanes Irma and Maria, they hit practically, they were direct hits, all the uh, small island states north of St. Lucia, the Lesser Antilles were, were hit. Uh, it's too early for, to, to have for a comprehensive assessment, but preliminary damage assessment suggests that between 80 to 200 percent of GDP were lost. We had at a workshop, we had representatives of the British Virgin Islands, for them the loss was estimated at 300% of GDP. That means three years productivity gone in an event like this. Now, nobody hopes or wishes or expects necessarily that this is going to be repeated, but with forecasts suggesting that the storms of that kind of intensity are going to arise more frequent, this is obviously becoming a more urgent uh, issue and more urgent problem. This here is showing you photographs of the um, airport in uh, Princess Juliana Airport in St. Martin, which had this, where the planes were landing over the beach, that's completely obliterated. And in several of these countries, Anguilla, Barbuda, uh, British Virgin Islands, I, I mentioned Dominica, they have had massive destruction as a result of the, of the, the hurricane season. So there is a real need for action. So what did our project do? Given that disaster risk reduction and adaptation of coastal transport infrastructure is critical for the sustainable development of these countries. We tried to uh, assist them by preparing, by developing a methodology based on a case study approach which focused on two different uh, Caribbean islands with different um, characteristics, namely Jamaica, a large country and much more diversified and uh, um, having quite a lot of uh, commercial trading, being a hub in the region, and St. Lucia, which is a tiny island, very typical of many of the volcanic islands in the area, very much dependent on uh, the crops in the past used to be bananas, but not anymore, uh, very much dependent on tourism, and um, <coughs> geographically a very difficult situation because volcanic, very little low-lying uh, low land by the coast, and very strong risk of landslides. So we looked at these uh, two countries and based on uh, an, an assessment of risk and vulnerability for the ports and airports that we selected in these countries, we developed a transferable methodology for assessing climate change impacts and adaptation uh, options in Caribbean cities. We uh, met to, uh, to refine this methodology in 2016 at an expert meeting, Austin was also there. Um, and in 2017, we had altogether three workshops, uh, two national workshops, one regional workshop, bringing together seaports authorities and airports authorities from 21 countries and territories in the region together, with also regional and international stakeholders and, and experts. I'm very glad to say we have, thanks to very effective and, and uh, synergetic collaboration, was very, uh, very dedicated, very generous and very very good partners. Uh, we have very good substantive findings as part of these studies and that includes marine inundation maps, state-of-the-art maps which illustrate the flood, flood risk for the ports and airports in this uh, area and make quite uh, disconcerting reading if you will. Uh, an academic paper on the results of this uh, or, or on some key results of our studies is under review at the moment and hopefully will be published um, in, in the context also of the work on the International uh, Panel on Climate Change report on the 1.5 degree scenario. That refers to the temperature cap scenario, which has been advocated by the small islands 
as an aspirational goal and is integrated in the Paris Agreement because above 1.5 degrees uh, temperature rise with reference to pre-industrial levels, uh, some of the Pacific small island uh, uh, developing states expect to be obliterated. I don't know if you, if you know about this, there are, uh, for instance, Kiribati had to buy territory in, I think it's New Zealand or Australia, I, I'm not sure, uh, because they fear they're going to lose all their land. Uh, in, in, in due course. So 1.5 degrees has been sort of set as a kind of cap uh, which is important for the SIDS but we're not necessarily on the best track to this shall we say. Uh, we will, uh, we, we are at the moment in the process of putting a web platform uh, up so this should be up and running in a few weeks. You've got the reference there so don't look yet but if you're interested in due course you can find all the results and all the studies there. Uh, I, before I end this, I want to show you just a little bit of what we actually did find. On the, in the inset, you see the two islands, Jamaica and St. Lucia. And on the bottom here, Jamaica, you see the ports and airports that we looked at. So I will describe this to you. I hope you can hear me. Uh, this is Norman Manley International Airport in Kingston and Kingston Container Terminal in the, in the uh, south of the island. This is Sangster International Airport in Montego Bay, where about 70% of tourist arrivals into the country uh, are, are um, recorded. And this is historic Falmouth Cruise Port, an important cruise port uh, in, in the country, and one of the destinations, one of the port of call of the, of the largest cruise ship uh, so far in the world. The, um, what's it called again? Harmony. The harmony of this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just escape. In St. Lucia, and again, I told you this is a very small <laughs> island. You can see the, the, the scale here. This is where the international airport is based, Huanora International Airport. This is the capital, Castries, where there is a regional airport, George Charles International Airport, and Castries Seaport. This is where 30% of the uh, population of the country resides and all the tourist resorts are in the main in the north. And this is the main road connecting the international tourist arrivals with the tourist resorts and with the capital. This is very much landslide prone, this road. There's another road which is much worse. This is much <laughs> more landslide prone. As you can see, there are a lot of eggs in one basket there. And uh, there is an obvious need to consider how we can assist these countries in resilience. Now, unfortunately, most of the uh, ports and airports there were under flood risk, and you can see this in the flood map. We were very fortunate uh, to have the generous contribution of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. They were working on uh, marine inundation uh, modeling. They had done a European study, and they were upscaling to global, and for the sake of our project, they were focusing on uh, these islands and particularly the uh, ports and airports. So we're very fortunate they've made this available to us for the purpose of our project. What you can see here is on the left here, this is Donald Sangster, that Sangster Airport in uh, Montego Bay. And you can see under all, we've modeled this, or not me, but they have modeled this under a different climate scenario for different uh, future scenario. So these are the RCP, representative uh, uh, CO2 emissions pathways. Uh, 8.5 is sort of a business as usual, the worst case scenario. RCP 4.5 is um, middle of the road, if you will. And this here is interesting because it's been estimated that the 1.5 degree temperature cap will be actually reached around 2030. So that's very, very soon. And under all scenario, Sangster Airport was very significantly uh, affected by flood risk. On the right, you see uh, Norman Manley International Airport and the Kingston Container Port, so to an extent as well. In St. Lucia, it was as actually more pronounced. Here, you see this is Castries, the capital. This is the port. This is the, the city, and this is the runway of the... Uh, regional airport, and that's a beach, Vigi Beach, and a lot of the flooding will come from the beach actually here in Vigi, but there is a very significant flood risk. This is Huanora International Airport, this is the end of the runway, 
uh, and again, under all scenarios, under all scenarios, there was a significant flood risk for these islands. So this is how far we got so, you know, until now. We hope we're working to, uh, to carry on with this work and to do some follow-up work. We're looking for funding for this. Certainly we know that this has brought the debate somewhat forward and these countries are in particular need of, of assistance um, because they lack the capacity to do this all on their own. Um, so we're very happy to work in this field. I find it personally gratifying to uh, be able to contribute in, 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 in an area where uh, you have some impact on the ground. But this is where we are so far. So I'm going to leave it here. There's much more to say, but I don't want to just be the one talking. I'd be very much interested in discussion and uh, answering any questions that you may have. So. Thank you.